You are listening to the Quarter Transmissions Episode 29. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. Tricorder Transmissions. I'm Craig Cohen. And I'm Jeff Hewlett. And this week on the show, we are finishing up our uh, season one with Operation Annihilate. Oh, God, you caught me off guard with that one. <laughs> well, it's got the exclamation point, right? I mean, that's how you're supposed to give it that extra little oomph, right? I know. Such enthusiasm. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the only original series episode that has an exclamation point in the title. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention Although- the hyphen. Yeah, although I think there's probably a couple episodes that could have used the exclamation point. Arena. Yeah, that, that would work. You know, another season one episode, and then looking ahead, uh, a muck time. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty uh, chaotic. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Doomsday let, Machine, maybe? Yeah, that. Let this be your last battlefield. Yep, uh, you could. You, that could be an exclamation. Uh, cat's paw? Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so it seems like most episodes could benefit from the exclamation point. They could, but I think this is the only one that officially got one. Yes. So what's going on in the world of Trek before we get uh, into Operation Annihilate? Well, uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, following up on his uh, COPD announcement on Twitter, appeared on the Piers Morgan show on Monday. Uh, I did happen to catch it. It was... Um, pretty good he talked a lot about his struggles with smoking and uh you know encouraging people to to quit and uh you know his diagnosis and everything and he did mention talk about star trek just a little bit uh piers morgan asked him what his favorite scene was which was kind of a interesting question to ask but uh nimoy started to talk about a muck time oh cool so yeah it's nice to know uh you know that's one of his most enjoyed episodes um unfortunately all the clips of the interview that i found online so far have been a a a shortened clip only a couple minutes and just about the uh the smoking stuff and they seem to have cut out the part about star trek so i'm hoping that somebody posts the full clip at some point in the near future so i can uh, link it to this episode yeah i i didn't see the interview but i did see some stills from it and uh nimoy looked pretty good uh yeah, he looked better than he has looked in some of the um some of the the photos that we've seen in the last week or so, uh the you know the wheelchair shot in the airport. So um, that was a casual shot, so maybe they caught him, you know, on a bad day, but yeah. Uh, yeah well, he's he... got like a cool hair thing going on now too. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He's got a little bit of a different um a different look at this point. Did you hear um about this uh, red shirts, yes, uh, the the uh, the the novel that mm-hmm. it was uh, what it, it took um, a look at the the real world implications of being a red shirt, meaning that uh, somebody finally notices that every time they beam down, ultimately uh, a red shirt or two don't come back. Yeah, so yeah, it's being what spun off into an XF uh, FX miniseries. Yeah, a limited yeah. series. Yeah, so it's going to be on the FX channel. Interesting that some. Uh, trek related content is going to be back on television yeah now the, the thing i hadn't read on and I'm, i haven't read red shirts but are they playing in the star trek universe or is it sort of like a galaxy quest thing yeah that's a good question i i've only read little snippets and things so i don't know if uh if it's going to be official trek canon or if it's going to be some kind of a you know a takeoff so i guess we'll have to wait and see more more details yeah, you know that will be exciting, and who knows? Maybe when it uh, when it finally hits the air, we can uh, we can devote some side episodes to uh, to covering that uh, that series. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. 
And you know, I always like to create more work for us. Yeah, why not? Well, we we all have time. We can we can cram more stuff in. Yeah, I don't even know when it's scheduled to to start. I don't think there's an actual date yet. It's yeah. just um, just some of the you know little articles posted here. And uh, one 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 more interesting thing is uh, Nimoy is quite busy these days, and he's appearing uh, uh, this Sunday on the Epix TV network is having a Star Trek fest, an all day Star Trek marathon. I think they're showing what looks like some movies. Uh, they're doing some uh, some close ups on the captains. You know, so there's a, a, a Shatner piece and a Patrick Stewart piece, but Nimoy is doing a uh, short, maybe ten to fifteen minute, what they're calling a conversation with Leonard Nimoy. That's supposed to air at seven forty five p.m. Uh, sandwiched between the Wrath of Khan and our perennial favorite, Into Darkness. Ah. All right, that's cool. I don't. I don't get epics, so uh, I don't know I, if I do either. I'll just have to follow along uh, on uh, the Trek-related uh, Twitter streams. Yeah, I, I'm sure that someone will post a clip of it shortly after it airs. Mm. So, and this will be, this will be happening probably right around the time this episode goes up, or after this episode has gone up. Uh, well, no, I think I'll usually have it up in the morning early. So, I mean, all right. Yeah. Maybe a handful of people will have heard this on the episode and, and maybe tune into Epics if they have it. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, very cool, very cool. Yeah. yeah, that's it's always good to see uh, see the uh, the property we love getting uh, getting its fair share of recognition and uh, you know airtime devoted to it. Yeah, definitely. Well, it it seems like there's no shortage of uh, Star Trek on television these days, but unfortunately, it seems to be mostly. Uh, next gen reruns where I'm yeah, at. Yeah, well, what B BBC America shows a lot of. Uh, oh God, yeah, yeah, constantly. So that's that's where I'm catching all my random uh, next gen episodes. <laughs> well, speaking of reruns, um, now that we're at the end of season one of Star Trek: The Original Series, what we're going to do over the course of the next two weeks after today is we're going to look back at season one and sort of do our our debrief on it or our, our wrap up, our final say, if you will. So what we're going to do, Jeff, is we're pretty much going to, going to recap what we've looked at. And then also once and for all hash out what's essential and what's not. Uh, yeah, it sounds pretty much like the plan. I I've uh, been preparing some, some notes for that. I've been going through all of my, uh, my past votes and, uh, just kind of writing down what they all were and the reasons why. And, uh, we'll, we'll recap those. And hopefully and, uh, change some votes. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to do that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you can try. Oh, man. And I would like it if our uh, if our listeners tried as well. Um, please, if you would, um, help us and be a part of this episode. Send us your thoughts on season one as a whole or a particular episode, a particular star, a particular guest star. Anything you want related to season one, let us know about it. You can hit us up on the Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com backslash tricorder transmissions. Yep, the tricorder transmissions. And then on Twitter, we're at TTT underscore pod. Yes, sir. Um, and if you go to the tricorder transmissions.com, you can find all of our contact information, including an email address. So uh, we would love to include some of your thoughts in our season one wrap up episodes. Yes, absolutely. I think we're going to be reaching out to all of our prior guests who've been with us uh, through season one on our extended episodes. So we've got uh, April, uh, we got Vernon, we've got Chris Ritzer and uh, Jeff Ferry. I think we're going to reach out to all of them and see if we can get some commentary from them as well. Ah, perfect. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to those shows because uh, it'll be a nice way to sort of look back at all the ground that we've covered already. Yeah, so we'll have 29 regular episodes under our belt at that point. And, you know, thinking back on on 29 hours of, of tricorder transmissions, there's a lot to go back and revisit, I think. So it should oh, be yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so be on the lookout for that before we start our uh, Season 2 coverage. Yes, definitely. So I guess it's uh, it's time now to, to, to start our commentary for the final episode of season one. Yeah. Amazing. We, how far we've come in, in such a, it feels like a short span of time, but actually when you look back on it, it's been quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I guess before we start our scene specific commentary here, what we're going to do is you have uh, some air dates for us. Yes, sir. 
So the original episode aired on April 13th of 1967, and our remaster came on February 23rd, actually pretty close to today, and 2008. Perfect. And I have the a real quick excerpt from the March 27, 22nd, 1967 NBC press release. The USS Enterprise attempts to stem an epidemic of mass insanity that it has already destroyed several planet colonies in Operation Annihilate on the NBC television network Star Trek, and that is that. Very <laughs> ominous. Very yes. ominous. All right. I was waiting to, to read ahead for it to say color cast, but it did not say that. Oh, well, we can just pretend it was there. Yes, that's what threw me off. All right, so I guess without further ado, we will uh, wrap up season one in three Two, one. Yeah, There's a cool angle on the ship there. I like that one. Yeah, it, it, they're mixing it up a little bit. Yeah, a little faded. It, you know, there's another or two more random <laughs> girls on the bridges that one of the red shirts is just kind of like standing there. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was like one of the captain's new yeomans. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, does Ahura always wear that black belt? I'm not that seems like a new addition to me. Yeah, I don't recall her wearing that black belt. I have to look back on that. Now, one of the interesting thing, things here for me is seeing what they end up doing remaster or, or you know, in terms of effects. Yeah, exactly. And here it seems like the um, you know, the the screen that Spock's indicating as good as it looks, it seems like that would have been a prime candidate for the remaster treatment. Yeah, you would think that because some sort of a instead of a you know a little clustered colored lights, they could have some sort of a real realistic looking star map up there or something. Yeah, I mean that looks like a light bright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fine, but it's just it's just interesting to see the choices they made in terms of what effect they were going to redo and what they were going to leave alone. Yeah, really. You know, there's all the dramatic lighting in these. And when they cut to McCoy's face, he's got that dark cast over him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh. They're, they've they've picked up another ship, and it's on a direct course for the sun. That's a pretty cool effect of the sun there, though. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It's very. That's a remastered effect. Yeah. A one-man vessel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how useful is that? Yeah, I mean, that... that... That kind of cracked me up a little bit because I'm like, what determines that it's a one-man vessel? Is it really so small that only a, a single individual can sit in it? I imagine so. Maybe they got uh, a little trunk you can stick some some cargo in the back yeah. here if you want to throw your golf clubs in. Because you'd imagine that a, a space vessel wouldn't have any kind of weight restrictions. Probably. Well, maybe maybe you know the thrusters can only uh, can only make it go so fast, and maybe you, you you can't add too much weight to it or. You can't achieve uh, uh, orbit or something. Mm -hmm. Well, it's got to be some kind of offshoot of a shuttlecraft. Yeah, potentially. Mm -hmm. But it has to be much smaller because a shuttlecraft can fit, what, like six? Six or seven, yeah, yeah. yeah. Outer hull temperature, 480 yeah. degrees. Now, it's, it's cool. I didn't do a compare and contrast on the uh, the original episode, but it's cool how you can see the vessel, the little tiny speck of it heading towards the sun. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's it's just kind of a little tiny. There it is. Yep. That's interesting shape too. I don't know if we've seen any other yeah. ships that were that shape. It kind of looks a little like a bird of prey. Yeah, it kind of in the silhouette. Yeah. Hmm. You notice Scotty's hanging out on the bridge again. <laughs> it's like a constant he's, thing. He's making up for the uh, for the lost time. So uh, the, the 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 vessel that they were pursuing there ended up crashing into the sun. Yep. And the Enterprise was able to pull away in, 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 in the nick of time. Yes. But it's interesting, you know, to see, and we've seen this before over the course of the season, that Kirk was willing to jeopardize um, the safety of the Enterprise and her crew to, uh, you know, until the last possible moment. Yep. Yep. He has you know, done that, and he'll do it again, too. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other captains would have been like, okay, we're— we're at the point where we're beyond comfort here. It's time to uh, to pull away. But, you know, Kirk had some information he wanted to gather. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he did he did uh, take a little bit of a risk. He certainly did. And yeah. then we get uh, one of the a, a crazy stinger. Yeah, absolutely. That. We find out that Kirk's uh, brother is on that planet. You know, when I was watching this earlier to um, to study up and, and take some notes, 
that that stinger overall to me just kind of uh, try to think of a good way to say it. I I, I think that illustrates the seriousness of, of of this show and the writing and how seriously the show took itself. So if you think about the other sci-fi shows that were big back in in the time that the original series aired, they all kind of had a little hokiness to them. You know, but Star Trek really was a serious thing. And, you know, you have these really serious stakes, you know, and they don't they didn't add any uh, when they added humor. It didn't make the show cheesy. It, it was intelligent and felt natural. I don't know if I'm expressing it properly, but. Oh, definitely. And I think that's why a lot of science fiction professionals responded so well to Star Trek because they were finally seeing a weekly episodic TV show that was presenting sort of hard sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I want, one day I want to do is I, I'll be industrious. I want to make a, a mashup video clip of Kirk handing tricorders <laughs> to red shirt girls on the bridge. Yeah. He, now um, I didn't watch this episode back enough times to, to verify it, but is does Kirk ever give um, a log in this episode? Yeah, he. I think he just did during the uh, after the um, after the stinger break. He was talking about the. Uh, are Are you sure? Possibly. All right. I didn't see anything there on the uh, on the old subtitles. You're about to see something here that we haven't seen from Kirk before, too. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, he's got a hold of. His brother's wife on the planet, and she's kind of, they're losing touch. And now Kirk is going to get snippy Yeah, Uhura. I'm not interested in your excuses, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kirk is emotional, and she's pushing right back on him, too. Yeah. And then she's, what, he's going to ask her to connect via a private channel? Yeah. Which I guess... To me, that doesn't make sense. Like, if it's a private transmission, it's somehow um, easier to transmit. Yeah, I don't know the the logic behind that. So Kirk's brother's a research biologist, by the way. <laughs> His wife's name is Aurelian. Yeah. So, yeah. This seemed like a weird addition to this episode, and I guess it was really a, a way to give the episode some real real heavy stakes off the bat yeah but making it his brother and his wife and his nephew just seemed really sort of inconsequential to me hmm well in the in an early draft of the script uh kirk's brother and family were not part of it okay so yeah and uh, supposedly in in the, that version um Aurelian, Aurelian was uh, just a regular uh, Denovan woman who was um, in a relationship with another guy, with the guy who flew his ship into the sun. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, somehow she wasn't infected by the creatures and was, was helping the Enterprise crew to, uh, to figure out what was going on and, and do the research. I, I kind of like that. I mean, here, I, it might be that I just feel bad for Kirk about what, what's about to happen to his family. Yeah. But, I mean, it just seems like it, it, it doesn't impact him, really. I mean, it's not referenced a lot or, or at all over the course of the series. Mm -mm. You know, so, I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's that big a part of his history when it should be. <laughs> no, you would think it would be more, uh, more, more prevalent, but... Uh... You know, apparently it, it, this was, you know, a lot, a lot of the continuity between the episodes just didn't didn't yeah. carry over. Yeah. And I love all of this location shooting. Yeah. So this was um, the TRW Space and Defense Park in Redondo Beach, California. Ah, cool. And it looks very, very sort of um, uh, futuristic. Yeah. For the time. Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, it is now uh, the Northrop Grumman Space Technology Headquarters, and uh, you can see it on Google Earth, apparently, if you're interested in looking at it. Oh, that's awesome. And I, and I got to imagine that a lot of the people that work there are, are scientific. I would think so. Um, so they got to get a real kick out of the fact that they work um, at a site where when they park their car and walk in in the morning, they're looking at a you know, the exterior location from an episode of the Star Trek, the original series. Yeah, it would be pretty awesome. I'd love to to walk around there. I wonder how much, how similar it looks today. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine, you know, it looks much different because, I mean, that architecture, um, there's really no way to change that. No, it's true. Um, unless, you know, the landscaping's different mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or they've added additional buildings. Hmm. Uh. That's, I mean, that's all possible, but, but I, yeah, I would like to think it would look the same. So I, I'm going to be able to take a look at Google Earth and see if I can spot it. Look yeah. at the door. I love it. This is the future, and things look just like they do today. You know, the doors look the same. So this, I think, is um, this scene is shot in in an office area of UCLA campus. Okay, I believe. Yeah, and the entryway, I think, was the cafeteria at the uh, Space Defense Park. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So some interesting uh, locations. So we, I know we, we're always fond of talking about how much we love the the on location shooting. Oh yeah, in these shows. So so much so much superior. Oh, Kirk's brother has a mustache. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was a, a guy that they cast that kind of looked like Shatner, or if that was really just Shatner with a mustache. Uh, hard to tell. I, I wish I could. I don't think it's Shatner with a mustache. I'd love to go back and look again, but yeah, we're in the middle it, of this uh, this commentary. Yeah. I love the kid he, laying on the ground in the background too. <laughs> He's really selling the fact that he's unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. Peter. So Kirk's nephew. He looks like somebody else. Yeah. Well, he looks like uh like like Bill Mummy from uh yeah. Lost in Space. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So they're gonna take him back. Take him back. Which is it's really strange to me that they would take him back to the ship not knowing what's causing uh, the insanity. Yeah, you'd think if they if they were afraid that it could be contagious. Yeah, really. Um, in any way that they wouldn't bring it back to the ship. Hmm. And it's a good point. Yeah. Peter, by the way, was played by Craig Hundley. Hmm. Um, and he had uh, appeared on My Favorite Martian and Bewitched. And after this episode aired, he got a, a regular uh, a daytime gig on Days of Our Lives. Oh. And we're going to see him on a future episode, and the children shall lead. Oh, yeah. Gee, I guess he goes astray after this. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't think he plays the same character. No, I guess not, but... Uh, we'll wow. have to look out for the uh, for the character name. Hmm. Oh, and we're back up to the ship. You know, it was nice Scott. He got to stretch his legs for uh, two episodes in a row. <laughs> he was on the away team. You know, in City on the Edge, and now, hey, look who's back! It's yeah, Nurse Chapel. Chapel. Yeah, we haven't seen her in a while. Yeah, that was wild. Um, I, I was, you know, trying to figure out the last time we had seen her. I honestly can't remember. It's been a while. I, I remember seeing her in um, the Naked Time, right? Because she brought Spock the soup, and he threw it out the door. <laughs> Great scene. I, I have we seen her since then? Um, I don't, I don't think so. We'll have um, to. Uh, well, maybe, oh wait, uh, she was on. Um, she was in. Um, uh, oh man, the what little girls are made of. Oh okay, yeah. which was after that. So have we seen her since then? Maybe she's just been recovering from, uh, from losing Corby again. <laughs> yeah. So we've got now another instance where somebody's in, um, sick bay, um, and they basically freak out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This seems. Like, I mean, how many times have we seen this scenario this season where somebody wakes up in sick, sick bay and they're extremely, extremely distressed? Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> so next, the uh, the next bed over could be uh, Van Gelder. Exactly. <laughs> and I guess there's, you know, you know, some similarities between, uh, you know, this episode and and that one. Yeah, slightly. In the in, in you know in the fact that you know people are going going mad. Yeah. So you're getting a, a little taste of what's going on. What what? So she says there are aliens or things that showed up on a uh, on a on a ship from another planet, and uh, the things made the crew of the other ship bring them there. So there's some sort of they're exerting some sort of uh, mind control or a uh, uh, persuasion on people. To travel from planet to planet so that they can spread. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
and McCoy's already said that these uh these people are in intense pain. So something is causing them pain. I think he's going to give a little bit more of a theory here. Uh, when she answers the questions, yeah, then you know something is uh something's causing her to feel pain to try to stop her from talking. It's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. And this is, you know, you know, at this point, this is a pretty sort of, you know, creepy um, setup that we've got going on. Yeah, it is, because you don't you don't know what the aliens even look like yet uh -huh. or or how they're infecting. The people like she said that they're things, so they're obviously uh, you can obviously see them, you know, they look like something. But and somehow boom. they're as like a body snatchers type thing, maybe. Yeah. And there, uh -oh. there was a, a final cry of agony, and then uh, it killed flatlined. It. Uh, Kirk is losing family members left and right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's the thing here. I mean, it, it seems like it, I, it, in this day and age, I don't think they would they would play this card. Yeah, no, I don't think so because they they kind of I don't know future future Trek series that can be kind of puss out a little bit. <laughs> You know, this the, the original series was not afraid to kill off some people here and there. Although Picard had a lot of what family issues because there's that whole sequence in generations where he's he's with his nephews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how much of that or if any of that played out during the regular Next Gen series, but yeah, uh, I don't know enough about Next Gen to to comment on that. If only Chris Ritzer were here. <laughs> he could tell us. Yeah. Yeah, and Kirk, uh, Kirk is is visibly shaken by all of this stuff. So I think Shatner uh, putting in a good performance here. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It beams down onto a staircase. Yeah, that seemed incredibly random to me. Yeah, because... why wouldn't they put him down right next to the away team? Yeah, or where they had that because the away team seemed like they were where they had initially beamed down at mm -hmm. the beginning of the episode. Yeah, maybe they just did it because it looked cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody's been seen, no other, no other denovans and uh, no aliens, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And the other sort of creepy thing about this is they're supposed to be in, in a, a really, really heavily populated area. Right. They said like 100,000 people yeah. in that city area. So look, that, the, the red shirt girl's wearing a belt too. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It looks like the Brady Bunch house, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's got With those the railings railing and, the, and, the, and the open staircase. The open uh, staircase. Uh-oh. Now they're, they're hearing a strange noise. I always love the noise these things made. Yeah. Very creepy. Look at those yeah. plants, too, in the background. Some weird-looking plant. There they are. The weird-looking floppy cell-looking things. <laughs> They're and they're great. not all uh they're not all uniform. They look different. So uh uh oh. And they're flying around, they're swooping. Yeah. Man, this looks quite dangerous here. Yeah, I actually have a, a quote from James Duhan related to the uh the effect of these of these guys moving. And it was um from his autobiography. Oh. And he talks about um the the flying omelets. Yes. <laughs> Those things went hurtling through the air on strings, and when the script called for one of them to smack Spock in the back, it nearly knocked him down. Um, that moment was preserved for the year-end blooper reel shown at the company's rap party. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if that if that blooper reel's out there or not, but uh Yeah, I read a I read a blurb about that blooper reel, and it said that uh they they swung the 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 creature at Spock and actually hit him in his butt. Yeah, uh -oh. so it was a little low up there. Oh, oh. Uh, it got Spock. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, I think that. I mean, it's such a a simple effect, but it looks awesome. It does actually. You know, you know they they were just using, I guess, you know, really thin fishing line or whatever. I mean, you don't see the you know the wires but no you know i mean they move it it you know nowadays they would dish you know they would just cg that and the and the the movement wouldn't look as sort of as random it would be very fixed and controlled yeah definitely Did you notice the, the the three red shirts just stood there they didn't do anything the two security guys yeah. they, just, they just stood there staring and yeah. kirk jumped in to help yeah. spot and here we have a supplemental log so uh 
Um, I don't know what, what I was thinking when I watched this episode, but maybe I was so caught up in the episode that I didn't realize that there were times where Kirk was uh, delivering information to us. Yeah, I think this episode has that effect. I think it can it definitely can draw you in. Uh, did you notice, though, as when they were on the planet before Spock got stuck, he said that the alien creatures don't register on the tricorder? Oh, wow, yeah. How weird is that? Like I, I, The tricorder so far has seemed to be able to see and, and, and read everything. And then yeah. they, these things don't register. Very weird. There's more dramatic lighting. Look at the shadowing on, on Chapel's face there. And McCoy's kind of chastising her because... Uh, She's not helping. And she wants him to do more. Yeah. Did you think at this point that there was something wrong with McCoy? Um, I, you know, I, n not necessarily something wrong, but I, I, I got the impression that maybe he doesn't know what he can do or he, he's not confident he can do anything. So he's kind of reacting with a, a bit of a, a bit of nastiness so it's like frustration, frustration. It's, yeah yeah you know yeah in retrospect or you know looking at it that way um that yeah that seems like that was probably the direction they were going yeah probably hey look he brought uh he brought kirk some calamari <laughs> yeah so apparently that's some tentacle that he he removed from spock and it's it's all over his body Oof. you know so he says conventional surgery can't remove all of it so there's just too much. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it looks like Spock is in bad shape. And the nephew is the same. Yeah. And McCoy here, he's wearing pretty much what the doctor on the the cage wore. Yeah, I think those are surgical scrubs, aren't they? Yeah. Those are surgical scrubs. Yeah. On the, on the cage, that, that, that doctor uh, never wore anything but this. Yeah, he was in his surgery scrubs all the time. He was just operating on everybody. <laughs> Even when nobody needed, he'd be like, he'd walk around with a scalpel and like, hey, you got a mole. You want me to take it off? Yeah. I got my scrubs. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, um, I think we're going to have a lot of cool stuff to talk about during the, uh, the season one wrap up because, uh, I've recently been reading, uh, William Shatner's Star Trek Memories. Oh, cool. A book that's been on my shelf for a very, very long time. Um, but he devotes, um, the opening, pages of that book to um the development of the series and mm -hmm. also um the cage which was an episode he wasn't even involved with oh. which i thought was pretty cool that is pretty cool i'm looking forward to uh to talking about that yeah sounds yeah. great now, spock has escaped the yeah. sick bay and he's obviously uh up oh, and there he is it, you know this scene i love this scene because this is a really good demonstration of spock's strength the Vulcan yeah. strength. Like it takes like four guys to muscle him and he's trying to nerve pinch yeah. Kirk. Yeah. I love it. And it also shows that Spock is really being affected by this because you'd think that if he was going to logically figure out a way to take over, you know, take control of the ship, he wouldn't have done it this way. No, absolutely. This is, this is Spock struggling to, to get control of himself, but yeah. failing. Mm -hmm. and acting violently which we don't really see from spock very often so it's definitely way out of character yeah but thankfully uh four guys could restrain him <laughs> and they're able to tranquilize him back to sleep and put him back in sick bay yeah. with uh restraints on him now how how cool is that they have a pain register they can show you how much pain he's feeling yeah, I guess that's like the uh, the futuristic version of when you go to the doctor and he says on a you know a scale of one to ten, where does this pain register? Yeah, that little that little meter <laughs> will do it for you now. <laughs> It'll keep you honest, I guess, too. Yeah, yeah. So pretty neat. So, so now you just said that um, you know Kirk's nephew, if he wakes up, will feel that same level of pain that Spock is currently feeling, which is apparently an astronomical amount of pain. Yeah, I'd imagine a, a youngster. Uh, wouldn't be able to handle that. Yeah. So Spock is now woken up and he appears to be in control of himself. But do we really know if he's in control of himself or if it's that's just the creature inside yeah. of him? Hmm. His delivery seems kind of uh, genuine. Yeah. Yeah. This is really cool. This is a, a really good insight into uh, Spock and the Vulcan mentality. So that he's able to, um, 
he's able to minimize this pain just by using his mind. You know, pain is a thing of the mind and it can be controlled. Yeah. So he's uh now Kirk's calling him out for the human half. <laughs> it's proving to be an inconvenience, Spock says. <laughs> so he's um obviously Oh, and he's t- talking about the creature and its thousands of parts. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. I apologize to any listeners out there who may be hearing a cat meowing. <laughs> My cat is apparently really frustrated that he can't get yeah. in here. At this point. I knew it wasn't mine because I'm sitting here looking at him right now. Oh, you can hear it? Um, I, Yeah. Sorry about that. But hey, it, it adds a little bit of a... Uh... A little bit of flavor. Yeah. We talked about before that we're probably the only Star Trek podcast that includes um, cat appearances on occasion. Yeah, I think that was my cat Milo trying to cast his essential vote. (laughs) It's not time yet, Milo. No, his his opinion doesn't count anyway. It's only us. But he can try to sway me. Yeah. So this episode we talked, you know, earlier about earlier drafts of the script. This was written by Steve uh, Carabazzo's who Mm -hmm. was ultimately, um, during season one, he came on board as a story editor um, before exiting. And one of the conditions of him coming on board as story editor is that he would contribute um, a script. Mm -hmm. And he finally was able to get a script to them uh, to be filmed for the last episode. And this is the only script that that he, you know, he he wrote and and went to, uh, you know, teleplay on uh, with his... With his name, you know, mm-hmm. not counting any kind of contributions he made as a, you know, a rewriter or anything like that. Hmm. And of course, cool. it had uh, its normal revisions by uh, Gene L. Coon and uh, Roddenberry. Oh, of course. Of course. So Spock, uh, Kirk has just told McCoy that uh, he is to help Spock and Kirk's nephew no matter the cost. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and here's a great scene here with... Yeah. With I, yeah. I love the fact that... that Spock sort of held it together until after Kirk left. Mm-hmm. And then he's almost doing this like mantra where he's, you know, repeating to himself that he's a Vulcan. Yeah. And watch this. Another demonstration of the Vulcan strength is going to tear the security straps right off the bed. Rip. Done. Yeah. That's like some Arnold type stuff, man. Yeah. That's like total recall yep. strength. I was just thinking of that. <laughs> just thinking of that. But at this this time, he's not violently jumping out of the bed. Yeah. He's actually calmly getting up. Here's another great scene. This is great. Where uh, Spock wants to beam back down to the planet's surface. And uh, Scotty says that the captain has forbidden anybody else from going down there. And we're going to get a little altercation here. Yeah. Yeah, and I like the fi- the fact here that you know Scotty isn't gonna allow anybody nope. to pull rank on him. No, nope. he stands right up to Spock, knowing yeah. full well that Spock could easily overpower him. Yeah, and do yeah. what he wants. Mm-hmm. Look at this. There he is there a little. Oh, oh, he got the pinch on the tech, and it Scotty's got him <laughs> with the phaser. Yeah, man, he's got the drop on Spock with the phaser, and he's not afraid to use <laughs> it either. Go Scotty. <laughs> That's great. I, you know, Scotty's tough, man. Yeah. He's always tough. I love it. That is great stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, this episode, uh, while we were talking about the writer, it was directed by a gentleman named um, Herschel Darty, who also worked on nine episodes of Wagon Train. Hmm. Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Um, 15 episodes of that series, uh, Boris Karloff's Thriller. Um, and he also was a frequent director for the anthology series General Electric Theater, hmm. where he won a Director's Guild Award in 1957. And he's going to return here for uh, The Savage Curtain. Wow. Yeah. He's got quite a career. Yeah. Huh. So Spock is now surmising that... Uh, they need to capture one of the creatures alive. And since he's already infected but can still control himself, he's the only one who can go down to the planet and retrieve one. Completely logical. Yes, absolutely. And uh, he's he's just talking his way right through it. And, you know, Kirk's got a little smile on his face, a little smirk there. Mr. Spock, yep. You know, his logic is 
Yeah, he's, sorry, the inescapable logic. There's the cat again. My, my <laughs> apologies once again. Yeah. So uh, Kirk's gonna let him beam down. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a crucial, uh, a crucial decision because without the, uh, without the creature, they can't figure out how to uh, undo what's been done. Or, sure, and yeah, and you sort of got the the nephew as the ticking clock. Yep. In addition to the planet full of, or you know, the the city full of people. Yes, yes. You need to figure out how you could you possibly save all of those people. You know what 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 could they possibly do? Look at this three this big muscle bound red shirt guy there. <laughs> the guy was pretty ripped. Yeah, and here now McCoy's you know voicing his displeasure at the fact that. Spock's really in no condition to uh, to beam down. Yeah, I, I don't think they have much of a choice, though. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. I love the little red toolbox that Spock is carrying. I wonder what that is. That Starfleet issue. Yeah, I don't know. That's another idea for possibly uh, for the upcoming uh, Star Trek convention this summer. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe just wear a you know a blue science officer shirt and get the red you know the red uh, toolbox. Yeah, and what is that weird looking weapon that guy was swinging? It's like a <laughs> What it looks that? like one of those uh, Dyson fan, bladeless fans. Yeah, one of those four hundred dollar Dyson <laughs> fans, right? I remember the first time I saw that at Best Buy, I almost had a coronary. You're like, what? I can stick my hand through it? Four hundred dollars for a yeah. fan? And look at this. We've got two, two. nerve pinches within what a, a two minute period? Yeah, that's really you know breaking the rules. Yeah. Uh oh, and Spock's having some trouble with the. Uh, it's the creature trying to reassert itself, I think. Yeah. And I this. love I love this remaster on Blu-ray where you can really see the details on that tiled wall. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, I, I, I'd hate to have to go back and watch them watch these episodes on a on an inferior format after having seen them a couple of times on yeah. Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. Because they're so great. You know, all of this detail, you know, and and it's, it's it's really great that you can see everything so clearly. Yeah, and I mean, this was stuff that they captured on set, you know, 40-plus years ago. Yep, yep. You know. Yep. Now Spock is is uh, positioning himself. He's going to try to grab one of these things. It's yeah. interesting. I guess they can detect that he's not – he's already infected. Oh, okay. And not try to attack him again. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. How afraid would you be over during this whole sequence of events? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't really be too happy about doing this. Oh, I'd be terrified, man. Yeah. I'd be shaken. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially after having gotten one in the back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, oh man, I'm scared right now. Yeah, it's freaky, man. You go and he's underneath about four or five, six other ones that they could just dive right down. You know, you never oh, know. Man, be careful, Spock. Yeah, come on, man. Get those salad tongs out. <laughs> Get those future salad tongs out and pick that thing up. And that's what the red box was for. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and I look don't at, know. I'm really gonna have to consider that for uh for the convention. It's a good idea. And look at look at this. This is the first time we're seeing uh Dr. McCoy's medical lab. Yeah. Pretty cool. A lot of weird looking apparati in there. Yeah. Yeah, this this uh this apparatus that he's got the um the little creature in. Oh, by the way, in case anybody out there is wondering, if you didn't know, they don't actually say this in this episode, but those creatures are called blasto neurons, oh, okay. according to the Starfleet Medical Reference Manual. Oh, yeah, okay. and it's a huge individual brain cell. Yeah. So once again. We're seeing another example of the uh, the hive mind. Yeah, like a collective, yeah. Yeah, so uh, kind of organic Borg-like. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess you can you can surmise that there is one, you know, giant brain somewhere controlling all of these things. Where is it? We don't know. Yeah. So uh, is it? Is it? And they, they said it's the that disease or the madness has spread over. You know, quite a few planets. Yeah. You know, going planet to planet. So where is the home planet? Where is the origin planet of these creatures? Is that where the brain is? Hmm. That would be like an excellent sort of uh, bit of fan fiction or even uh, 
if they had a Star Trek television network and they were looking for content, they could do the Borg versus uh, these uh, these omelets. Little omelets, little flying omelets. <laughs> you know, though, I, one thing that, that kind of does bug me mm-hmm. about this episode, and I'm jumping forward to the end of this now, and, and you know, not to spoil it, but I'm really surprised that Kirk, after dealing with this scenario didn't immediately f- go and find the home world of these things and eradicate them. Yeah, well, I mean, they took out his brother I know. Uh, and his, his sister-in-law. Yeah, I mean, you would think that that would be the first thing on his mind. We've got to find out where these damn things came from and just wipe them out completely. Well, you know, it's funny, you know, had maybe another writer um, other than Bennett been tasked with trying to find up, uh, you know, come up with a story for... Uh, Wrath of Khan, you know, they might have looked through uh, season one and been like, you know what? How about Kirk goes in search of these omelets? <laughs> that would be really, really cool. And it would have been another revenge picture, but it would have been flipped a little bit. <laughs> well, you know what? I actually, from what I've what I'm reading, the uh, the original script or the original concept uh, did actually have the Enterprise destroying the home planet. Of the aliens, oh neat! Yeah, annihilating the central brain, um, which would which was the uh, we're going to find out that these creatures can be destroyed by light. But in the original concept, that wasn't the way you killed them. They killed them by taking out the central brain. And uh, so, it wouldn't them. that seems like that would definitely be against the prime directive? Yeah, well. You would think, you would think, but uh, you know, is there a, w- wouldn't there be some exceptions to the rules? Well, we've seen exceptions this season. Yeah, but I mean, official exceptions, not like you know, Kirk just deviating. Yeah, but yes, know. but I mean, you'd have to assume that that would be you'd be ending a species, right? Right. Well, I, I imagine if it's a if it's a if it's a destructive species that can't be reasoned with or or otherwise. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, controlled or or that pose a threat. I don't know. I'm trying to maybe think. they're maybe they're misunderstood like the Horda though. Yeah, maybe they are. You know, we sh- we we could have seen Spock doing a mind meld with one of these things. Yeah, well, a mind meld with he would have to do a mind the meld entire with, collective. with the brain with the brain itself, wouldn't he? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. We, well, we've seen his powers sort of be. Uh, you know, uh, modified to fit the uh, the needs of the script. That's true. He's done non non physical uh, melding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kirk has just kind of gone off the handle on uh, Spock and McCoy, saying that uh, he wants a third option. He doesn't. He wants everybody to think outside of the box. Yeah, and, and this is to... the, this is the Kirk that sort of beat the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, perfect. You know, the no-win scenario. This is why he's Kirk. Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree. And, you know, he's, he, he put, uh, he put uh, Spock and McCoy on the hot seat with him, so he's not going to go down alone on this one. Yeah. Well, and this is sort of, again, where we see how effective Kirk is as a captain and how not everybody could be a captain. No. Where he knows how far he can push these people. He knows their limitations better than they do. Yep, exactly. Kirk is a great manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now they're trying to pontificate on how or what in the sun freed the uh the the single ship single guy in the ship from uh from from the, the monsters. So you know, of course they jump right to Spock jumps right to the the complicated stuff. It converts matter to energy. It mm-hmm. has mass. And uh, and McCoy just kind of throwing up his hands. Yeah. He's like, we tried everything, radiation and heat. And then Kirk figures it out. Yep. One thing you haven't mentioned is it's bright light. Yeah, it emits a radiates a blinding light if you're close enough. Mm-hmm. And then McCoy says there's nothing lethal about light. <laughs> Out of all the crap he's seen so far, <laughs> you know, you would think he'd be a little more open-minded. You know, and Spock seems to be agreeing. He's like, yeah, maybe. That could, that could work. Yeah. So now they're trying to figure out how they could uh, 
generate that generate much. that kind of light. And of yeah. course, Spock can figure this out in two seconds. <laughs> a string of satellites. There we go. And of course, they yeah. ha- try Magnesite and Trevium, and they happen to have all of this stuff on board the ship. Oh yeah, yeah. Why not? They have a you know few dozen satellites on board they can deploy. Yeah. That's so, too much. Pretty cool. Pretty yeah. cool. So uh, mm. here we go, and we're gonna put the little uh, the little amoeba brain guy in his little habitat inside this uh, this testing rig. And they're going to try to shoot the light at it and, and uh, see if it kills it. So this is interesting. One million candles per square inch, Spock estimates. That's pretty bright. That's pretty damn bright. Now, what kind of candles, though? Are they like the little birthday candles or like, uh, you know, a, a tea candle? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good, I'm thinking a Yankee candle. One of the big jars? Yeah. Yeah. Now, why don't safety glasses in the future have straps? Why do they have to hold them up? Come on, man. <laughs> Nurse Chapel isn't even trying. <laughs> she barely even had that thing on. And here we go. Did it work? Did it work? Like they all squeeze in. Yep. Yeah. Sure enough. Look how happy McCoy is. Yeah. Yeah. So now they've got to try it on an infected person. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the tough part here. Now, here we're getting to the point where, um, you know, Spock's going to something really big is going to happen to Spock. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the Spock chooses to put himself in that position where he knows, you know, that that amount of light, you know, is going to is going to have a serious effect. And he can't wear safety goggles. Because oh, yeah. They have to to duplicate. Uh, you know the the conditions on the planet, and Spock is willing to put himself on the line, not only for the crew of the Enterprise, but for all of those people on the planet. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Now, what I want to ask you here, though, hmm. is if they were making this show, um, after 1980, would they have made this ending a cliffhanger? Hmm. Considering that this is the end of the first season, a lot of series, um, and Next Generation was a series that mm-hmm. did this, um, where they left the you know the crew in serious peril, mm-hmm. um, you know, in between seasons. Yep. You know what? You you you, it, you may be right on that because you know we we've talked about this before, especially in during the Menagerie, which is the only two parter mm-hmm. in the entire original series. To have a, a you know a cliffhanger that spread over two episodes, so there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, could you imagine watching this and and Spock's about to be blinded? Yeah, and that would and be and then great... having to go through the whole summer. Yep, wondering um, how and if Spock is going to get his sight back. Yeah, I, the, as soon as he comes out of this thing and bumps into the table and says, "I'm quite blind," that would have been the fade to black. Yep, right, right? there. You're I... Like what? Uh-huh. Would have been perfect. Yeah, I really think if this series had been made 15 years later, it would have been a a, a season-ending cliffhanger. Yeah, very different. Akin to, like, you know, J.R. being shot yep. and, you know, Picard becoming a Borg. Yep, yep. Now, you know, McCoy just said that Spock is the best first officer in the fleet. That's pretty huge. Oh, yeah. A big compliment from McCoy. Yep, here we go. They're scuba masks. Yeah, with beehives on them. But they don't have straps. They have they yeah. have holes in the sides for straps. Yeah. But they don't actually have straps. I wonder if there was a, a decision made to take the straps off of those and just have them hold them up for yeah. for the purposes of the of the production. So you wouldn't have to have putting them on and taking them off or something like that. Yep. And it worked. Spock is all right, and the creature's gone. Phew. But, yeah. And look at this. He seems to be perfectly okay. And <laughs> oh, 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 walks right into the table. And he's also quite blind. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. Okay, roll credits, and now we have to wait all summer. <laughs> yeah. And and he says it's an equitable trade. Yeah, hey. And he thanks the doctor. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you were suddenly blinded, would you be able to keep your composure like that? Am I part Vulcan? No. Then no. All right. 
<laughs> but I think if I was part Vulcan, I, I, I could probably handle it a little bit better. Mm, probably. Uh-oh. You- Uh-oh. And here we go. McCoy effed up. Yep. Oh, man. He didn't need that much juice. No, he didn't need to throw the whole spectrum of light at him. Interesting. And, and Spock's not even mad. Yeah. He ain't even mad. Yeah, you know what? I mean, come to think of it, they could have just been like, okay, we're going to try it with this many uh, candles per square inch and just, you know, you know, amp it up. Yeah, well, he you didn't know, need to throw the, the white light. That was the thing. He didn't He didn't need the blinding light at all. Yeah. Oh, man. And up, oh, Kirk is in cred. <laughs> oh, man. See, but, you know, he, he should just fire McCoy right now. Well, I mean, you really think that if if um if if Spock was permanently blinded, that there probably would have been um some kind of charges levied against Bones. Oh, absolutely. Because if you think about when, when Kirk jettisoned the pod. Uh, exactly, a court martial. Yeah, there was a court martial. Yeah. I'd yeah. imagine that, you know, the, the doctor might have been uh disgraced oh and look at this we get some cool little uh yeah the remastered shot of the of the satellites deploying Mm -hmm. now i think out out of all the remastered effects we've seen so far that this one with the satellites being deployed it pushes the the envelope the most for me as being uh, almost too over the top to fit in well yeah i mean that's clearly uh um an action happening that they couldn't have done um in 67 no and they and also see the the way the satellite looks it looks it looks like something that they could not have done Mm -hmm. uh back then even the even the coloring yeah it really stands out as something that that could not have been achieved you know with the effects that they had of the day Uh uh-oh and all the omelets are falling the light is working this is a neat effect too how they kind of they disappear into a little puff of smoke Mm mm-hmm yeah, kind of sizzling away like somebody's burning the omelets. <laughs> Nothing worse than a burnt omelet. Oh man, and they smell terrible too. <laughs> mm. God. So, but you know that was a um, a lot, a lot of great tension there between Kirk and McCoy during that scene. Oh yeah, yeah, that was really great. Yep, and the things are dying, so everything's working. Uhura seems very happy about that. Yeah. And why not? Yeah, why not? Why not? So, yep, we are... uh, And Kirk is going to check on on Spock again. This is some great tension here. You know, Kirk... I I, I think Kirk is really pissed, and he's just trying to keep himself from just throttling McCoy at this point. Yeah, but, you know, at the same time, I don't think McCoy should really take the full blame here. No, nah, maybe not. Because it was sort of a an idea they all came upon together. Yeah, and well, Spock could have uh, Spock could have said something to the effect of maybe try other you know bands of light. You know, maybe don't need all of them. Sure, He's, and I mean, you'd think that the science officer would have more insight there than the doctor. Potentially, potentially. Oh, and there's this random red shirt back again. Yeah, and Spock. That's that her whole reason for being in this episode was to go, look, Mr. Spock. Yeah. And Spock can be seen and he can see again. And we're going to find out that another mysterious Vulcan superpower of inner eyelids is a hereditary yes. trait. The brightness of the Vulcan sun caused them to develop an inner eyelid that acts as a shield against high intensity light. And it's instinctive. <laughs> so he can't control it. Yeah. I'll tell you that that Spock. Oh man. He can get out of anything. Yeah. Yeah. So no cliffhanger for you, Craig Cohen. No. But I mean it, it really, you know, it would it would have been a cool cliffhanger. It's not one I would have enjoyed. I mean, I, I hate waiting between seasons on TV shows, especially when you have a really effective cliffhanger. Yeah. And and Spock being blind would be an incredibly effective cliffhanger. That would be pretty awesome. So, oh, you're we're, we're, another nice uh, episode ending bit of comedy here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you Kirk know. is uh, Kirk is kind of pushing on Spock to, to see if he's got any kind of an emotional reaction to getting his sight back. And now, uh, you know, McCoy is going to kind of mumble, uh, 
mumble some stuff here about about Spock and uh yeah, don't tell him I said he was yeah. the best first officer in the fleet. And sure enough, you can hear him. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You forgot about his Vulcan years. So okay. here we yeah. are at the end of the uh, last episode of season one. And I guess for the, the last time this season, we are going to have our essential uh, nature discussion. Yes. Yes, we are. So, um, well, I was having a tough time coming to a, a decision on this one. Uh, I've got some things that I think could put it over the edge. And, um, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a balancing act here. So um, some cool Spock stuff, of course. You know, you got the inner eyelid thing, which does pop up again uh, in, in other series. So, uh, you know, a little more insight into into the Vulcan physiology, uh, his high tolerance for pain you know, more of a great demonstration of his his brute strength, you know, on the bridge where you get four guys holding them down. I think there's a lot of good Spock information here to take away from this. Um, you got another uh, rare uh, non-humanoid alien. So we don't have a lot of those. You have the Horda, and now you have these uh, blasto neuron things. So not a lot of those floating around. Um, so... Kind of the you know the whole hive mind idea, so we're getting to see that happening again. Um, some really great character moments between uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in this episode. Some some really great exchanges there. You know the the tension uh, between Kirk and uh, McCoy when Spock becomes blinded. You know you get a lot of insight into Spock's character during that time where you know he's he's just kind of. You know, accepting of the fact that he was blinded by and saying it was a, an equitable trade for for being free of the creature, uh, some really cool stuff there. So, um, I'm kind of leaning towards essential on this one. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you didn't mention that I'll add is we learned that Kirk, at least at one time, yep. um, had a brother, yep, <laughs> and uh, a nephew, and uh, you know, a sister-in-law, and um, a, a brother who ended up dying on an episode of star trek and yeah um as little as it's referenced if at all in future episodes uh, if you're really looking to tip towards being essential mm -hmm. in my opinion you weigh that against how entertaining this episode is and i say it tips it over towards being uh an essential star trek episode oh wow cool so uh the final episode of season one is an essential one fantastic Wow, so we, we have just finished our journey through uh, season one. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking back on it now. It's uh, amazing how far we've come Yeah, in, yeah. Uh, in this span of time. Yeah, so like we mentioned on the, uh, the introduction, um, over the course of the next two episodes, we'll sort of be uh, recapping season one, um, reassessing possibly, and just looking back and reviewing what we've watched. And again, we would really like your input here. So if you have uh, any comments about season one, um, feel free to hit us up on any of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, or email. Mm -hmm. And you can find all that information over at the tricordertransmissions.com. Absolutely. We look forward to hearing from anybody who has anything to input. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. So I guess, Jeff, um, I will see you this time next week for um, part one of our season one wrap-up. Yes, sir, you will. All right, well, take care, everyone. Captain Kirk's brother, George Samuel Kirk, was first mentioned in What Are Little Girls Made Of? But until this episode, he was never seen. Now, you might notice a strong family resemblance between Kirk and his brother. Did you get a close look? Sam Kirk should look familiar to you, since he's Bill Shatner, pulling double duty as both Captain Kirk and, by adding a mustache, his unfortunately deceased brother. Of course, playing a corpse is not exactly the most difficult of roles, considering that there are no lines to memorize, you don't have to worry much about hitting your marks, but nevertheless, Bill took it seriously, and he took the extra time to play the part. <laughs>